Number 8. Anna Sorokin When you're a 20-something con artist trying to make it in New York City, what do you do? Anna Sorokin's solution was to create the false identity of a European heiress, befriend the city's elite socialites, and defraud banks in order to start her own company. Sorokin defrauded New York City's wealthiest under the alias of Anna Delvey, the heiress of a European tycoon who had allegedly built a multi-billion dollar solar panel empire. The young con artist's base of operations was Eleven Howard, an upscale boutique hotel in the heart of the posh Soho district in New York City. Sorokin showed off her wealth by tipping in $100 bills, dining at the city's most upscale restaurants, and booking private fitness sessions that cost nearly $4,500 each. Because she built her reputation for years before even arriving in New York, Anna Sorokin was able to quickly become friends with the city's CEOs, athletes, and even some movie stars. She was described as sociable by those who knew her and seemed to know everyone. Despite her shady background, her elite circle of friends became her ultimate endorsement. Former friends of the globetrotting con artist recalled how they would pay for her lavish vacations. She'd ask them to cover the large bill, which could be anywhere from a few thousand dollars to more than 65000 and promised to pay them back later. But as you can guess, she never did. Sorokin persuaded Michael Zhufu Huang, the founder of the M. Woods Museum in Beijing, to accompany her to Venice Biennale, a high-end art exhibition in Italy, according to Huang. She asked him to use his credit card to pay for plane tickets and the hotel, which cost him several thousand dollars. He didn't notice she hadn't paid him back until he got an online message from the restaurant where Sorokin had held her birthday bash and, quote, forgot to pay. Sorokin allegedly forged financial documents to the City National Bank, claiming a net worth of $71 million in Swiss accounts so that she could get approved for the $22 million loan in November 2016. She later submitted the same documents to Fortress Investment Group in order to get an additional loan of $25 million. When the banks demanded payment for due diligence, she transferred a portion of the funds from other accounts in her name, some of which were opened with bad checks. Sorokin was kicked out of Eleven Howard eventually and moved from one hotel to another without paying her hefty room bills, according to the New York Post in July 2017. She was finally arrested later that year in October. In April of 2019, Anna was charged with three counts of grand larceny and an additional count of attempted grand larceny, and she was sentenced to three years in prison. On February 11, 2021, she was released, only to be detained yet again just six weeks later for immigration violations. According to the BBC, Netflix paid Anna $320,000 for her story, which was turned into a Netflix TV show called Inventing Anna. But Anna didn't see most of the money. This was thanks to a New York law that prohibited criminals from profiting in any way from their fame. Even after she was paid by Netflix, the authorities froze her accounts, allowing her victims to reclaim the money she had taken from them. Anna is currently in ICE detention after overstaying her visa in the United States and is fighting deportation to Germany. Number 7. Wolfgang Beltracci the German painter Wolfgang Beltracci may be an unfamiliar name to you, but he is widely regarded as the greatest art forger of our time. He deceived the art world for years by using an unusual and ingenious technique. He recreated paintings that had been lost but were known to have existed at some point in history. The forgeries were so good even experts thought the paintings were originals and true masterpieces. Beltracci and his wife Helene produced hundreds of fake paintings over four decades, selling them to collectors for millions upon millions of dollars. One of his forgeries was even displayed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City at one point. Specialists eventually caught on, and on October 27, 2011, Beltracci and his wife were sentenced to six years in prison, of which they only served three. Beltracci rose to fame as a result of the scandal, and now he makes a fortune painting original works. It's a mystery how no one suspected them sooner. Number 6. Bernie Madoff Bernie Madoff is widely regarded as the greatest con artist in Wall Street's history. Madoff's deception began back in the 1990s when he established a fair reputation as one of the first actual wolves of Wall Street. He ran his own trading firm, served as chairman of the Nasdaq, and frequently spoke at public stock market panels. Madoff was regarded as a savvy money manager, which meant people who wanted the best person to look after their money and could afford his services went to him. 
With a pristine reputation in one of the world's most influential financial institutions, Madoff easily duped clients into surrendering their money. But people in the industry started becoming suspicious when Madoff's popular hedge fund continued to make high returns even when the recession hit. He dodged questions about the hedge fund's unusual success, telling the press he couldn't reveal how he did it because it was proprietary information and a company secret. Eventually, Madoff was unable to keep up his act when clients started hounding him for their money. According to investigators, Bernie Madoff's hedge fund was a massive Ponzi scheme in which he took money from new investors in order to pay highly profitable returns to his existing investors. In December of 2008, Madoff was arrested. In a plea deal, the con artist admitted to 11 counts of fraud, money laundering, and more. He was sentenced to 150 years in prison for his mastermind schemes, which defrauded countless clients of billions of dollars. He died behind bars on April 14, 2021, but the world will forever remember him as one of history's greatest scammers. Have you ever pulled off a con? Let us know in the comments. And if you liked the video so far, be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest videos. Number 5. Frank Abagnale the majority of our next con artist deception took place way back in the 1960s and 70s. Despite this, his legacy is so notorious we just couldn't leave him off the list. Frank Abagnale began his criminal career at an early age, when he used his father's credit card to purchase items at a gas station. After purchasing these items, he would return them and ask the station employees to give him cash in exchange. He swindled thousands of dollars this way and later moved on to automobile theft. This evolved into frauds such as posing as a pediatrician in a hospital for almost a year and visiting 26 countries as an imposter on Pan Am planes. Abingdale was able to pull these jobs off thanks to his otherworldly charm and persuasion skills, which allowed him to talk his way out of any situation. His antics prompted the production of Catch Me If You Can, a film based on his actual life. The popularity in media made him one of the most famous imposters of all time. He was arrested several times in the early 70s, each time though, he escaped. In the end, he was offered a release on the condition that he work for the federal government, assisting in finding fraudulent checks and other scammers like him. Abagnale is now a successful security consultant based out of Charleston, South Carolina. Number 4. Jerome Jacobson Almost everyone who's had McDonald's has heard of the fast food chain's popular monopoly marketing campaign, but they've certainly never heard of Jerome Jacobson. The man who made millions by secretly rigging the game with a nationwide network of assistants, Jacobson was simple man from Ohio before he committed the McDonald's Monopoly scam, which was one of the largest to take place outside the finance industry. Jacobson and his wife Marcia relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, where he got a job as a corporate security guard. He worked for a firm that handled the Dittler Brothers accounts, a publisher in charge of printing the game pieces for McDonald's $500 million sweepstakes. McDonald's Monopoly was the more well-known name of the game. Customers had to find the most valuable Monopoly pieces hidden in the packaging of their meals in order to win. As Jacobson and his wife headed for divorce after some rough waters, he was hired to manage the security for the game pieces. The con man was actually put in charge of keeping the valuable items safe, from printing to distribution across a number of restaurants. This meant he could get his hands on the game pieces worth anywhere from $2,000 to $1 million right away. Jacobson began stealing game pieces to give his friends and family. They would turn them in as if they found the piece on their meal and then split the winnings with Jacobson. Soon, his scheme grew into a nationwide network of over 50 people, including ex-convicts, psychics, a Mormon family, a member of the Colombo crime family, a man he met at an airport, and Andrew Glom, a gambler and ex-con in Florida who also distributed winning game pieces to his friends. Jacobson used this money to buy multiple properties across the country, go on luxury cruises, and stock his garage with exotic cars. He made a total of $24 million by the end of his decade-long scheme. The scam didn't last long, though, as the FBI busted all of them in August of 2001. Jacobson was convicted of mail fraud conspiracy and sentenced to 15 years in prison. He also agreed to pay restitution of $12.5 million. The bizarre and twisted con became the subject of an HBO documentary, McMillions, which premiered back in 2020. Number 3. Elizabeth Holmes Silicon Valley in California is a hotbed for con artists who make empty promises about the quote, next big thing, when it's usually just the same thing in a different font. 
Elizabeth Holmes, the founder and CEO of the now shut down company Theranos, was one of these very con artists for many years. The then 19-year-old was a bright-eyed Stanford University student back in the early 2000s. She approached her professor with a bold concept, a skin patch that could easily scan a person for infections or diseases and then release the appropriate antibiotics. She essentially wanted to create a one-stop shop lab for treatment on a small scale. The professor told her the idea was physically impossible, but Holmes didn't take no for an answer and was obsessed with her rapid testing concept. She dropped out of Stanford to establish Real-Time Cures, which was later renamed Theranos. Holmes worked on the company's machine prototypes for years. Finally, she claimed Theranos had developed a rapid blood testing machine that could provide immediate medical results with just a single drop of blood. The news of Holmes' breakthrough spread like wildfire throughout the valley. Insiders raised Theranos' profile and investors poured nearly a billion dollars into the company. She was hailed as the industry's next breakout star and graced the covers of magazines like the New York Times, Style Magazine, and Fortune. She was even dubbed, quote, the next Steve Jobs by some. But her machines turned out to be a hoax. To give the impression they worked, Holmes thought up a complex web of lies. She fabricated blood test results, misled investors about the company's financial prospects, and lied to the press about the capabilities of her creation. She was also said to be a boss from hell who fired anyone that questioned the legitimacy of the machine. While many con artists devise elaborate schemes to obtain wealth, Holmes won recognition and fame. A number of federal agencies launched investigations into her fraudulent business as a result of the reports. Following the news about Theranos, Forbes magazine reduced Holmes' previously estimated net worth of $4.5 billion to zero. And not too long after, in September of 2018, Theranos was shut down. The con artist was charged by several federal agencies, including the Department of Justice, for wire fraud. In January 22, Holmes was found guilty of defrauding investors and faces up to 20 years in federal prison. Maybe she'll learn there are some people you shouldn't lie to. Number 2. Charles Gilbert Murphy in the 90s, a 64-year-old man was charged with an elaborate scheme that cost his victims over $350,000 and landed him in federal prison. In 2013, he was released but later returned after pleading guilty to wire fraud and aggravated identity theft last year. On top of this, he was ordered to pay just about $910,000 in restitution to his victims. That's Charles Gilbert Murphy for you, the con artist who is still defrauding people past retirement age. Murphy had been accused of creating at least six companies that we know of and opening bank accounts for them using his own family members' names. The businesses presumably provided environmental cleanup services. Murphy applied for loans using forged bank statements and tax returns. He's also accused of using businesses to find supposed entrepreneurs that want to buy exclusive rights to environmental cleanup services. Murphy duped his victims by forging documents claiming funds had been set aside for services in the areas they purchased exclusive rights for. He also impersonated a professor, a mayor, and an agent with the Environmental Protection Agency to make these companies look like good investments. A grand jury indicted Murphy in October of 2019, and he was arrested just a few days later. Since then, he's been incarcerated in the Abamarley District Jail in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Seems like age truly is just a number for criminals like Charles Gilbert Murphy. Number 1. Jordan Belfort Let's wrap things up with one of the present day's most well-known con artists, the one who's not only famous for his deceptions around the world, but also respected because of them. Of course, we're talking about Jordan Belfort, the actual Wolf of Wall Street. From the early 1980s to 1996, Belfort worked on Wall Street. Here, he founded Stratton Oakmont, his investment firm. It was there that he pioneered the infamous pump-and-dump scheme that's been replicated so many times since, in which he bought stocks at rock-bottom prices and then sold them to naive investors for double the price. He had over 1,000 stockbrokers working for him at one point, selling over a billion dollars worth of stock on a regular basis. The NASD had consistently pursued legal action against Stratton Oakmont throughout its history. The company was ultimately closed down in 1996 after countless scandals. Belfort and his business partner Danny Porish were charged with money laundering and securities fraud in 1999. Belfort admitted to scamming his investors out of over $200 million, and he was sentenced to four years in prison, which he completed after 22 months. It sounds bad, but hey, we got a cool movie with Leonardo DiCaprio because of it. 
Thanks for watching! Can you think of any other con artists that belong in a video like this? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe! See you next time on the Bad Badger!